So, um, welcome everyone. This is a presentation on automated testing in Drupal, um, talking about uh, testing strategies and also uh, providing a peek at a testing tool called PHP Spec. Uh, my name is Kevin McCulloch, um, and I work for New Target. New Target is a uh, agency that is based in the Washington D.C. area, um, and we came out to. Uh, bad camp this year uh, in part because we're growing and we are looking to hire devs um, and so if you're uh, in the in the market for work and uh, interested in talking um, please come and let me know um, but uh, I am uh, as a new target employee on site full-time at the administrative office of the US courts um, which is just the uh, organization that supports the judicial branch um, and so uh, um, we have a number of sites that we do supporting the public affairs office for the courts, uh, including a massive multi-site Drupal, um, which provides uh, uh, sites for um, individual federal courts all around the country. So district courts, probation courts, bankruptcy courts in different states, um, they use that uh, um, uh, Drupal installation for their, for their site. Um, and like a lot of... Uh, uh, Teams we've been developing for a long time, you know, you've got a lot of stuff in production, but we don't have a whole lot of automated uh, testing in place, and particularly with the multi-site, um, you know, where we have you know about 150 sites running off of a single code base. You can imagine that doing any kind of change in that environment without having any automated testing um, is uh, uh, is really hard. So. Um, this talk today is talking a little bit about our uh, efforts to put testing into place and kind of what we have learned uh, over, over the last year. Um, and we had an uh, opportunity come up this year with a new project, just uh, a pretty simple internet project. Um, but uh, it's a, a Greenfield project for our team. We're like, great, this is, this is wonderful. It's a brand new project. We will do test-driven development uh, from the outset. Um, and this will kind of teach us something about what test coverage looks like, and maybe we can go back and think about you know, putting that in place for this other larger project. Um, and so, uh, you know, hurry, right, let's let's go forward. Let's do it. So, um, the first slide that I that I have is just talking about kind of testing in general, right? So, you know, why is it that we want to do automated testing? Basically, for two reasons. Um, you know, the first is that. Uh, Test-driven development helps to uh, um, define requirements for the application and guide implementation. It's a tool to help you write better code. Um, the second reason that we test is that uh, we want to have something in place to guard against regressions. So if we change the code, or if we patch a module, um, or anything else in the infrastructure changes, you know, we want something automated that we can use to look and just make sure the site hasn't broken. Um, so as far as uh, uh, the first bullet point, you know, defining requirements and guiding implementation. Um, the uh, technique that is sort of most commonly uh, talked about for doing this is uh, um, story level behavior driven development. Um, and there is a, uh, a tool uh, in Drupal that you guys probably know uh, called BHAT. Um, it's a, sort of the testing tool for Drupal that I think sort of has the most. Uh, kind of the highest profile in terms of conference talks and blog posts and things like that. And so that's kind of where we start, right? Um, and, you know, in reading up on BHAT, BHAT is a PHP implementation of, uh, of a Ruby tool called Cucumber. Um, so there's a book called the Cucumber Book. I read the Cucumber Book. Um, and, you know, and it kind of outlines sort of the philosophy behind, uh, you know, this kind of story-driven process, right? Um, and so the process, you know, uh, just a few fairly straightforward uh, um, steps. We start out by writing tests, which are acceptance tests for various features that we know that the software is supposed to have. Um, and so it's an acceptance test in the sense that once the test passes, the feature is there um, and you know, uh, it has been accepted, it's acceptable. Um, we write them in a business domain language that's shared between stakeholders and developers. <coughs> so, you know, instead of talking about you know, HTML uh, um, elements or classes, or even you know necessarily talking in Drupal language. You know about nodes and blocks. Um, we try to develop some sort of a some sort of a language. You know that um, sort of makes sense to the project folks. Um, so you know we we talk perhaps in terms of, of particular content types, right? So on, on some of our sites we have forms, 
um, you know, has a, a certain page that holds a downloadable form that someone might want to go and, and look at. Um, the tests follow a, uh, you know, kind of a, a finite state machine sort of structure um, of having a initial context, um, an action that happens in the course of the test, um, and then an outcome of that uh, from that action. Um, the tests are meant to be declarative um, and not imperative, um, and that's uh, kind of a, a fancy way of saying that the steps in the test should really just sort of assert that things happen and assert that things are true. You shouldn't be writing tests that need to go through various steps to make things happen, right? So the, so the, the simplest example is, you know, if, if some particular action is supposed to happen when a user logs in, then your step should simply say, when I log in. Right? You don't want to be writing tests that are sort of saying, you know, when I go to the login page and I type my name and I type my password and I hit go, right? Um, that's, that's a, um, uh, you know, sort of what, what I mean by imperative, you know, sort, of, sort of spelling out steps, right? Um, and then the final, you know, sort of uh, promise of this approach is that taken together, these stories comprise uh, a kind of living documentation for the application, right? So, you know, they are ways of expressing things that need to be done, um, but they, uh, um, you know, live in the, uh, in the code base, they're executable, right? So you can actually write one of these things that says our code should do this, and then you can actually run um, a little checker that sort of ensures that the code, in fact, does do that. So our thinking initially was like, well, this is fantastic. We will just do this for all of the requests that come from the client. Right? And so we will write the test first, um, which ought to help us to kind of organize things in a good test-driven manner. Um, and then uh, um, we will have a whole suite of tests, right? You know, kind of one or more for each feature. So we'll have uh, some kind of coverage for the application um, sort of at the, at the end of the day that we can use down the road when we need to patch things or whatnot. We want to make sure that things are not broken. Okay. Um, it's not that simple. Um, and it hasn't worked out quite like that. And, and the next few slides are sort of my attempt to kind of explain why that is. So here is an example of um, uh, a BHAT test. Um, uh, successful sign up as a scenario, you know, given I've chosen to sign up, when I log in, um, then I should receive an email and I should see a greeting, right? So this uh, follows our story level uh, behavior-driven development principles, right? It is an acceptance test. If, uh, you know, when uh, a login happens, if these things happen, then, you know, then the test is passed, you know, it's, it's acceptable. Um, it is in a business-readable language, right? Our product owners, they understand what an email is, they understand what a personalized greeting message is, there's nothing technical here. Um, the context action outcome structure is clear, right? Um, and this is uh, declarative, it's not imperative. You know, it just says, given I've chosen to sign up, when I do that. Um, it doesn't sort of spell out all the steps I need to take. Okay, so with this kind of template in mind, um, you know, I started sort of looking at the particular requests that came in for working on uh, the, um, the new internet site that we're building. And you know, I basically just have an example that was just in, the, uh, in our JIRA system you know, when I put these slides together back in, uh, back in July. Um, and what that is, so this is a page on uscourts.gov, um, and one of the elements of this page is a block for downloading related files that are related to the content. Um, and so uh, content creators, when they're making a page, they can you know, sort of say that I want to have one of these blocks here, and they say what files they want to have there. And then files, you know, a little name, a little icon, it says the type of file and the size of file. I know that's really tiny, but it says like PDF, uh, 455 kilobytes, right? Um, so the basic user story was like, hey, we have this on uscourts.gov, we want this in the new site, right? So that's, that's what I got. Um, so I talked to the product owners about this, um, and, you know, it turns out that there's a fair number of requirements that this thing needs to satisfy. Um, so, you know, there's some, some limitations on what data is acceptable here, some specifications about how the file should be displayed, um, some kind of workflow kinds of things about when we can make one of these, 
um, the ability to reuse these from page to page, because sometimes they'll have a, you know, several pages that all sort of constitute a report, and so they won't have the same, just kind of download the PDF block on every single page, right? So, you know, so there's, there's a bunch of stuff um, that we need to attend to to, uh, to put this thing together, right? So how am I going to make this? It is mostly a site building kind of uh, requirement. Um, I will be using a whole bunch of contrib modules to make a, uh, you know, we use the bean module to make these as little sort of block entities that can be uh, reused and attached and, you know, some other, some other stuff. That little bit there where it says the type of the file and the size, there's no particular out-of-the-box formatter in Drupal that gives you that exactly. So I need to write a little routine that's going to look at a file and extract mm -hmm. that information and format that. So there's a little bit of coding here, right? Um, you know, then we need to style the thing. So you know, we use SAS uh, to um, you know organize our CSS. So we got to get that, um, and then the block needs to actually land on the page and be positioned, right? So there's a lot of configuration. There's a little bit of you know of code, kind of both some PHP and also some SAS. Lots of tiny little pieces here that sort of need to be put into place. Um, and because, you know, there's, there's, as with a lot of Drupal sites, you know, there's just a lot of contrib modules that are sort of there. You know, lots of things that could release security patches that, you know, might need to get updated down the road. So, so just lots of tiny little pieces, right? So I'm like, all right, let me, you know, take this and sort of think about how I would write a, um, you know, a test for this. Um, so... You know, writing a test, uh, you know, in, in the language that uh, the BHAT uses, um, which, because BHAT is a PHP port of a Ruby thing called Cucumber, the language is called Gherkin, so it's Gherkin and Cucumber, that's, that's what that <laughs> is. Um, so, uh, so here's a little, you know, a little test, right? Um, when I visit the page, given a page with a related downloads block, um, you know, when I visit it, then I should see that block in the sidebar. Okay, so that's you know that's that's a that's something that I can write. Is this a good test? It, it's okay. Um, it is declarative, so that's good. Um, it is written in domain-specific language, right? In this case, just you know related downloads block. That's something that's intelligible to the product owners. You know, their Jira ticket says, like, hey, we want a related downloads block. You know, I can bump it in, in the hall, and they can ask, hey, how's the related downloads block going, right? So, so that's, that's a, a business kind of language. It conforms only barely to context action outcome, right? Um, you know, the action is just visiting a page. So it's not an interactive kind of thing. You know, it's not like, oh, I'm filling in a form and hitting submit or I'm clicking something on a page that's going to use JavaScript to sort of change the page, you know, bring something in, take something out. It's really just, it's, 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 it's fairly static. So, you know, I mean, it is, there is technically something that happens um, that we had, you know, can sort of pay attention to, which is, which is just that it oh, it loads a page. Um, but it's not terribly interactive. So that's, so that's something that, you know, makes, gives me a little bit of pause. Um, but the truth is that the tests that you're going to write, unless you're sort of, you know, going to really go in and, and write a whole lot of custom step definitions. If you're using the sort of step definitions for BHAT that come with a Drupal BHAT extension, your uh, test is going to start looking something more like this. Um, you know, I have to sort of declare that there's a page with some stuff on it. I have to declare that there's a sidebar block with some stuff on it. Um, you know, and then my my tests are, you know, kind of specific to that. I should see these strings of text in various regions that are, you know, that are sort of there inside the, um, uh, um, inside the markup. So, this is the kind of test that I have been finding that people are writing with BHAT, right? Um, I did as, as part of my research, you know, I, I just went into GitHub and just like you can kind of search through the code to see like, oh, there might, like, surely there are some big open source Drupal things using BHATs. And I found a, a handful and they tend to be tests that are sort of like this. Um, I don't like this test. I don't think that this is something that's, that's going to help me very much. Um, the things that I don't like about it, first of all, it has dipped it down from the kind of declarative, you know, you know, when I do this, then, then this happens, thing down into implementation details, right? You know, it's suddenly I have to have the names of fields um, in my test, right? 
um, you know, and, and you are on the aliases and things like that, right? So it's becoming, this test has become coupled to, um, you know, implementation details inside Drupal. And that makes tests more likely to break. The closer that they are sort of coupled to things, if for whatever reason the name of a field changes, you know, suddenly a bunch of, of tests will break. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, much more, um, uh, um, sorry, I'm misreading my notes. Um, in order to test the things that I need to, to, to test, you know, particularly if I want to test the little bit that I'm going to do that's going to sort of, you know, do the file format and whatnot. You know, in order to test that properly, I really kind of need to pass in files of different formats and different sizes and just sort of make sure that my little component is sort of getting the right information out of the file, you know, and sending it out. So probably, you know, I, I want a test that's going to sort of do that formatting for three or four of these different things. Um, and BHAT, the, 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 the thing with BHAT is that it's a functional test runner. For you know, for your entire site, so it has to bootstrap all of Drupal uh, in order to run these tests. Um, and so, in order to kind of test all these these little sort of implement de implementation details, I've got to write, write a lot of these things, and they're going to be slow to run. And if I want to do a sort of a proper kind of continuous integration thing, where you know every time we push, it goes to some you know sort of uh, job runner that's going to sort of build things and run my tests. You know, well suddenly I have this this bottleneck of you know an hour or two hours overnight, you know, that it takes to sort of run all of my tests for all of my commits. Um, and that's going to be, that's going to be a problem. And then the other thing about it is that it is not testing my CSS positioning on the page, you know, I mean, it's not testing any kind of uh, responsive behavior of, you know, when I, when the page is a different width, does the block move to the right place, right? So it leaves a lot of stuff out that I care about and stuff that might well break you know, sort of for, for regressions down the, down, down the way. And so, you know, this, this is kind of a way of just sort of uh, explaining the process by which we kind of started out with a lot of enthusiasm for BHAT, and then once we started really looking at it, we're like, this tool is actually not the right tool for, the, you know, for, for the kinds of stuff that we want to do. It's, it's not really helping us with our uh, development, you know, in, in, in a kind of specific targeted way of giving me some guidance on how to structure the code. And it's not really going to help with regression testing. I mean, this test, you know, I mean, this test will probably pass, but there's a lot that could break without this test noticing it. Um, so, um, so, so here, here's, here's my, my list of reasons to sort of be wary of the BHAT uh, tool, um, you know, particularly if you guys are sort of starting out with testing and just, you know, kind of getting a sense of sort of what's out there. Um, Essentially, you know, I, I basically said this, it's slow, um, you know, if we're committed to, to true sort of behavior-driven development as a kind of acceptance, uh, you know, strategy for our user stories, we've got to write a lot of, of custom tests so that we can write our BHAT tests and back up that much more kind of general language rather than the specific, uh, the specific language. Um, and it's just not going to help us very much with full regression coverage. So, you know, um, when I gave this this talk in uh, July in DC, I was talking to someone who uh, um, had been following the development of um, uh, Cucumber, um, you know, the, the Ruby uh, library. Um, and Cucumber originally sort of sh shipped with a whole bunch of little step definitions, like when I go here and when I click this. Um, and apparently, the uh, um, the author of Cucumber sort of decided that that's actually kind of giving people an easy means to write bad riddle tests. Um, and you know, and so apparently at, at, at some point, um, I should probably confirm this story actually because I'll just, some dude told me this. Um, but apparently, so I hear, <laughs> at some point uh, the, the author of the library went in and took all the tests out and it was a, there was a big kerfuffle. I don't know. Anyway. Um, the, it's true. It's true. Okay, it's true. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 you know, so the BHAT, you know, part of the reason why BHAT for, um, you know, testing Drupal sites is kind of right there at hand is that, you know, um, uh, some folks put together a uh, Drupal extension for BHAT, which implements a whole lot of these step definitions. Um, and it, it, it's awesome, I, you know, never want to denigrate people contributing tools um, to us. I think that's really great. But it sort of replicates that problem. You know, you sort of start out and all of the tests you see sort of do this, you know, this kind of uh, imperative kind of testing. Um, so, you know, so, 
where BHAB is concerned, there are reasons to use BHAB, I'll get to that on the next slide, but BHAB probably is not your first st step. BHAB, I think, is going to be a tool that you want to have in your arsenal for testing your sites, um, but you're only going to want to use it in very specific circumstances where it really does help. Um, and so, you know, so how, how should we use uh, the extension then, use it sparingly? Um, I think of it more as a test script runner um, than a, a behavior-driven uh, development design tool. Um, so really, anytime that you, if you have a QA or just you know you yourself know, like, oh, all right, how am I going to check this? I'm, I'm going to load this page. I'm going to click this. I'm going to do that. You know, um, you can certainly write little sort of behavior scripts to do that. But you know, but but think of those as uh, uh, test scripts. Um, focus on areas of user interaction, right? So, you know, just the, the kind of like when I visit a page, sort of BHAT tests, I just don't think they're good BHAT tests. Um, you know, when, when I visit a page and I interact with an element on that page, then BHAT is going to be much more valuable to you. Um, and then, you know, finally, sort of look at that kind of page rendering stuff. Um, you know, most uh, commonly in cases where that rendering should differ based on conditions. So, user conditions like roles or permissions or entity conditions, you know, like published or not published. So if you have situations, um, you know, I think some BHAT tests are, are good for things like, like uh, workbench permissions and sort of user groups and things like that, you know. If I'm in this group, then I should see this on the page. If I'm in this other group, then I should, I should see that on the page, you know. Um, you know, those, those, are, those are the kinds of, of, of places where BHAT is gonna help you out. Um, but for us, and you know, it depends a lot on the kind of site you build. Ours are basically public information sites, so there's, they're not super interactive. For us, like 80% of the things that we're asked to do in the user stories that we get, they're just not this stuff. There's stuff like that sidebar block, right? Um, so, you know, this this uh, raises the question. Then, going back to our uh, sidebar block, then, um, what should we do for testing? Um, you know, I would say, you know, you can certainly write a user story, uh, you know, when this, then that, um, if it helps your agile project management, but I would skip adding a future time code for BHAB. I just wouldn't use it. Um, for the tiny bit of code we're writing ourselves, we, I want to use PHP spec. I think it's a really good tool for this, that little sort of middle area stuff that you're writing. Um, and then for general regression test coverage, uh, I think you're, you're best off just using a visual regression testing tool. Um, Wraith is one that I know a lot of folks are working with. I was at the DevOps Summit yesterday and uh, someone did a demo of Wraith. Because uh, what that will do is it'll just basically just take a snapshot of a, of a page in a before and after state. Um, and so if the block moves around or things you know, get sort of uh, you know, um, uh, Put, put out a whack because you've changed the line height in your CSS, or something disappears from the markup, you know, because some some something that was supposed to provide a, a value to the page suddenly is uh, is not working right. Um, that's going to be just a much better sort of cost-effective way of just noticing, hey, something's changed, rather than trying to write you know a gazillion B hat tests to sort of look, you know, more specifically for things that may have changed. Um, if that makes sense. So that's all a kind of long-winded preamble then to uh, um, talking about uh, PHP spec. Um, before before I, I do that, so I'm, I'm going to um, shift over now and, and show you guys a little bit of code, um, which basically kind of gives you a sense of what PHP spec is and shows you sort of a, a design approach for bootstrapping it into Drupal 7. Um, before I do that, though, any questions or thoughts on the first part of the presentation here? So when I comment, my experience is exactly the same, and I feel very validated knowing that I'm not crazy. <laughs> so. Thanks. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> this particular talk, I, I know it's I've kind of shoehorned together a whole lot of stuff about the hat, and now I'm going to certainly do the PHP spec. And, and the reason is that I, I gave this talk without the PHP spec sort of at the GovCon a couple of months ago, really as a kind of a sort of shooting up the flagpole kind of thing. I figured out, you know, that I knew there would be people in the room who had experience. I figured I would either hear back, like, oh, yeah, this is a fair set of concerns, or I would hear back, you're doing it wrong. Um, and so I didn't get the, you're doing it wrong. I, I got the, it's a fair set of concerns, but I also got a kind of like, you know, but, you know, show us something we can do um, that's cool. So that's, uh, that's what I'm going to do with the PHP spec. So um, PHP spec, uh, 
it helps with um, behavior-driven development. Um, it does so at kind of a lower implementation level. So PHP spec describes itself as a behavior-driven driven development tool, um, but it's not uh, a tool that's sort of structured around a user story. It's much more structured around thinking of your code in terms of little sort of autonomous components that behave in certain ways. Um, so in that so in that respect, it's closer in spirit to what you think of as unit testing, um, in that you know it's not going to correspond directly to user stories, um, but it also allows us to test a lot of different uh, um, scenarios without needing to bootstrap the application, um, and so that is uh, a huge win, right? Because if you're sort of if your whole test strategy is kind of test everything and be hatch, you're kind of inverting the uh, um, the pyramid. I don't, I don't know if you guys have seen this um, uh, pyramid. If you read up on testing, you know, you know, basically your functional tests, which are things like behatch, you know, should be sort of up here at the top, um, and down at the bottom you have your your unit tests, which are much more mechanical. Um, you know, if you're sort of doing everything through behatch, and, and the reason is that these are you know kind of easy to write, um, you know, and cheap to run. These you know are expensive to run and break easily, right? So if you do everything, you know you're inverting your pyramid. You sort of have way too many, you know, really sort of uh, hazardous stuff. Um, so um, so you know PHP spec is kind of you know sort of down here, sort of you know it's not precisely uh, unit testing, just because it's as a tool it's opinionated about how you do your stuff, um, and it's uh, it, its opinions are close to my own. Um, so so I, think it's a good, I think it's a good tool. Um, yeah, and so, that, right, so that's what that third point is saying. So, um, so I'm going to mirror my display so that I can actually go through code without going nuts. Um, okay. And to, 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 I will certainly make this much, much better. Bigger. Is it readable? Can you increase the contrast? Uh, it looks yeah. Like the font is gray, maybe. Well, it isn't actually. Ah, <laughs> but, well, then maybe you can't. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Ah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Movie times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's um, okay. So. Um, yeah. So basically, what I what I have done is um, I've simply made a little module, um, and the code for this, by the way, it's in a GitHub repo, uh, um, and I've linked to that on the session page here, so you guys can go download it, you know, and sort of spend some more time with it. I'm going to go kind of fast through it, and you know, sorry, uh, time's just a little limited that way. Um, but uh, all that this module contains is I've simply taken a, uh, a hook from the Drupal examples modules, and I've refactored it. Um, in a way that allows us to use PHP spec. Um, and uh, someone uh, before the session was asking, you know, um, the example I'm going to show is in Drupal 7. We're still in 7 um, as, a, as a shop. I know a lot of folks still are. Um, I think that, that these techniques are much more natural in Drupal 8 just because Drupal 8 is already namespaced. It's already much more sort of component organized. Uh, dependency injection is already something that you're sort of, you know, getting your head wrapped around if you're working in 8 now. Um, so I'm going to kind of you know leave it to you to sort of sort of backport it, but I suspect that folks, particularly folks working on legacy projects, that I, you know, seven is going to be around for a while. I think that these are great techniques, um, and there's no reason not to start using them. So, um, so uh, just real quick then. Um, so here, here is a. Um, I'm gonna. Yeah. Um, this this is an example from the Drupal examples module um, of just doing an alter hook on um, uh, on a on a block view, and you can see it just it has a whole bunch of um, you know sort of uh, um, conditional logic you know sort of if, if this is true and then it has some data processing logic um, and you know that's what it does. Um, here it is, um, sort of refactored uh, to use uh, PHP spec. Um, and so you'll see that uh, what I'm doing here in this hook 
is I'm actually creating a service wrapper for Drupal. Um, and I'll explain what that's about in, in a second. Um, and then I am creating a little processor object, um, which is going to essentially s sort of act as a little independent application um, that does some business logic for, for me, um, and that can call back to Drupal to use Drupal functions and to access Drupal data if it needs to. Okay? Um, and so, you know, I've refactored uh, the code now, so now my conditional is just simply if, you know, just goes into a, a function for my processor, um, and then, uh, you know, if that function returns true, um, I have just two separate uh, um, functions in the processor, one to deal with the data array that comes in, um, and one to deal with the block. Um, and so, since I've started doing this, my books pretty much all look kind of like this. They're, they're very sort of clean and simple. You still need to write the hook to get Drupal to the point where it can use your components or do, do your stuff. But basically, you just kind of say in your hook, like, hey, I'm making this thing that I consider to be nice and well tested. I'm going to pass in some stuff from Drupal. It's going to do some stuff. It's going to pass some stuff back. And then I'm going to let Drupal have that um, and, and away to go. Okay. So um, the block processor itself. Um, is here uh, um, in the module as well. It's namespaced um, using the conventions for Drupal 8, um, so basically Drupal name of module. Um, uh, and um, actually, can I ask you a question? Are, yeah. So, are we looking at custom code that you've made, or is this from PHP spec? Like, what are we looking at? Is this is PHP spec a library that we're in, in, invoking, or is it just a way of doing things? Not just, but is it a way? It is a library that we're invoking. Okay, yeah, it's, a, it's a testing tool. Okay, yeah. good. and so yes. block processor comes from the library. No, this is this is something that I wrote. Got. It. Okay. Um, so basically, what we're looking at right now is just the way in which I have refactored a Drupal hook. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, so my block processor class is going to take as a kind of dependency injection this Drupal service wrapper um, that that uh, um, that I was talking about. Um, and uh, and then I just have you know these functions that I've written that basically do more or less what we saw in the original hook. Um, you know, uh, I made a little sort of uppercase and string uh, helper function. You know, to just sort of look and see is uppercase. Um, you know, sort of in the the subject or the title for the block. You know, so return true. Um, and then here, uh, um, if we go back and look at the original hook again, let's let's do that real quick. Um, you'll see that this hook uh, uses the function where my cursor is, uh, this Drupal string to upper function. Um, and it's just one of Drupal's uh, kind of library functions. It, you know, it's, it's a wrapper for PHP's string to upper, but it does some uh, character encoding, you know, kind of uh, normalization stuff. And so, you know, when you're writing hooks in a classic way, you're calling Drupal functions all the time, right? You know, the T function you call everywhere. You know, you may call node load. You may call any number of things. Um, and so the, the technique of having a little Drupal service wrapper is that you just take all of that stuff where you're talking to Drupal directly and you put it into um, just a little helper that's going to do that talking for you. Um, so, so going back again to the, uh, the block processor, um, you can see that uh, down here in the code, um, you know, how, how now am I transforming the title to the uppercase? I'm using my Drupal service wrapper, this guy here, and then I'm using a, a method called call to call Drupal string to upper, and I'm passing in um, my, uh, my block and my title um, into that function. Um, and so that function, um, you know, all it does is just takes the name of a function and a set of arguments, right, and just, you know, uses PHP's call a function with arguments uh, um, utility to, uh, to make that call. So if this is running when I'm actually inside Drupal and Drupal is actually running, um, it's just going to find the Drupal string to upper function in the global namespace because Drupal is fully uh, bootstrapped and loaded and it's going to run it and it's going to return um, an uppercase version of the string. But what this allows me to do when I'm testing my block processor, and this is where we're writing, this is where you're going to see the code that PHP spec um, actually uses um, to, to, test my, to test my classes. 
Um, I'm going to write a class uh, to test my block processor called block processor spec. Um, I'm going to pass Drupal um, into that uh, um, uh, into a function called let, which is going to do a little bit of setup for for this particular test. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just essentially going to you know take this Drupal object. I'm going to use the library to say, hey, this this object should now just be a uh, um, a double of Drupal. It should be a mock of Drupal as a, as a service. Um, and if in my test, uh, you know, when you're running my test, if my code um, calls uh, the Drupal string to upper, um, uh, um, you know, if it, if, it, if it uses the call method to call that function with this particular um, uh, argument, it will simply return the argument in uppercase, right? Um, and that way I can go through and I can write just little test cases, right? Um, that sort of test the different methods that are sort of, that are in my, that are in my object. Um, so, I suspect that this is way too fast, um, and a lot for you guys to, uh, absorb. Um, but let me just quickly kind of show you the, you know, the execution, um, environment. Um, so, um, to get PHP spec, you know, into a module or into your project, you'll use Composer. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a library that uh, can be managed by Composer. Um, and so you'll, you'll end up with uh, the executable, um, uh, which will be inside uh, Enderbin PHP spec. So what I can do from the command line is I can simply run my tests. Um, and my little object, right, um, this, is, this, is, this, is the, this is the conceptual takeaway. I've now organized my code into a little object that is just decoupled from Drupal. Um, and it has been specified in terms of how it should be behaved, um, you know, in order to sort of help me with some processing task. Um, my little object, PHP spec, can just load this thing up and can kind of say like, hey, you know, little object, how, how are you going to do your thing, right? Little object says, well, at this point in the code, normally I would call out to this Drupal function to uppercase a string, right? Um, spec can simply say, all right, let me give you a little mock of the Drupal service, right? Um, and just kind of pretend that you called it, and you know I will pretend that you got a response from Drupal, and, and here's the response that you're going to get. So the the, um, the the takeaway with working with PHP spec as a as a tool for specifically for behavior driven development is that you wind up, um, you know, taking your code out of just kind of the general C of the Drupal namespace and defining very tiny little testable components that then talk to Drupal as though Drupal were just any external service, right? Um, you know, you put them in a hook so they are, you know, they're going to get invoked inside of Drupal, but they are autonomous little critters um, that, uh, um, that you can then write tests for, and those tests can run down at that low level of the pyramid. You can run a gazillion of these um, in no time at all because you're not bootstrapping Drupal in the least. Um, and so for that, that one little bit of uh, the user story where I just need to write that little formatter that's going to take the file size and name and give me a string back, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to make a little object. Um, it's going to take a file uh, object of some sort do my little formatting, and then I'm just going to write some tests that say, if the file type is, you know, is a Word doc, you should see doc. If the file type is a spreadsheet, you should see XLS, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so that is my super hasty, hope you got a basic idea of PHP spec um, piece. Uh, if you are interested in looking at this, yeah, grab the repo. I actually wrote a pretty lengthy README file to kind of try to explain this stuff a little bit. Um, and uh, um, yeah, uh, you can take a look at it there. Um, so yeah, so basically, I think if I got it right, what you've done is you have some code in a alter hook, mm -hmm. and you duplicated it elsewhere mm -hmm. in such a way that you can test it without bootstrapping Drupal. Right. Okay. All right. 
And what? And so, how is that different from PHP unit then? Uh, yeah, that uh, is uh, a, a good question. You can do something similar with PHP unit. Um, in fact, PHP unit is is probably a more flexible tool all around in terms of its uh, capabilities. Um, and that's something I, you know, as I was kind of putting this together, um, I, I just I wanted to kind of demonstrate that you can actually do this um, in Drupal and give a kind of a sense of it. I'm not sure that this tiny little example really um, helps to explain the sort of the the design value of PHP spec. Um, I'm not sure I can even communicate that in a 45 minute session. Um, what it essentially kind of comes down to. Um, I, I was talking to a colleague of mine who also really likes PHP spec over PHP unit. Um, PHP spec, the way that these tests are constructed, let me, let me pull the, the test file back up again. Actually, let me just put up without the. Uh, um, yeah, let's pull it up here so you can see a little better. Um, the, the basic sort of paradigm, um, the, the let, the be a double of, the calls, the be constructed withs, um, it's going to sort of push you to do good component uh, architecture of your code. You know, to really sort of define things in terms of tiny little, you know, sort of single purpose uh, objects that, um, you know, that, that, that act as services to help other objects do their work. Um, and so I have been working with PHP spec for a while, you know, I, I saw another talk where someone was like, hey, this is really great, you should try it, you know, I was kind of wrapping my heads around it. And it was kind of when I sort of realized, like, oh, you know, what I can do is I can just write a service wrapper for Drupal, and suddenly Drupal is just a, is a service to the code that I'm writing. I'm, I'm no longer sort of completely coupled in that, you know. Um, and then I just need to, you know, how do I do that? I need to do that in such a way that, um, you know, that that little thing can be mocked and can be injected as a into um, you know into whatever processor I'm writing, um, for example, uh, the structure of PHP spec as a language will will nudge you in that direction. Um, it will help you to kind of structure your code in terms of components that behave a certain way, um, which will help you. You know, it, it helps you to see the forest uh, for the trees. Um, I think you know, working with in my experience working with PHP unit, I just kind of end up kind of remaining at the level of the trees. And I can write little PHP unit tests that sort of help to, you know, you know, sort of, sort of do checks on things that I'm writing otherwise. But it's not helping me with design. And that's, I think, the sort of the, you know, why PHP spec really describes itself as, as a behavior-driven development tool as opposed to simply a unit testing tool um, is because the, the entire paradigm is sort of organized around this behavior. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, it does. I think I think maybe this exact example is quite close to PHP unit, and it doesn't quite cap. But I can right. get that there's some space to go up where PHP unit will keep you down below. And then the other part that I'm getting is that uh, if you're able to treat Drupal as a service, mm -hmm. that means you have access to all the code, but you don't actually have to have bootstrapped it in order to be inside of the context of Drupal, and that's what's critical in order for these to run fast. Right. Yeah, and you know, so something that I'm working on right now, um, you know, which kind of illustrates this a bit better, is that we are um, for uscourts.gov. We're shifting our video um, provider uh, from one um, vendor to another. So I'm doing a kind of a big migration, um, and you know, we just we have a whole lot of nodes that embed videos on them, and I have to sort of change all those videos to, into pointers. And you know, for kind of kind of complicated reasons sort of related to the way that our video provider sort of organizes metadata for different videos and things like that. I've needed to sort of work with their API to kind of go into, into the back end there where our video production folks are sort of uploading videos and tagging them and organize things in such a way that they can then be consumed by Drupal, right? And then Drupal sort of stores all these things in a whole set of nodes. Um, you know, and then there's there's a couple of little pieces that sort of coordinate all of this. And so what I'm building, just as a you know, it's it's a um, it's code inside of the Drupal module. It's going to sort of run inside of Drupal, but it's basically it's a little sort of control center for this whole process. Um, and so I have little service objects that talk to the videos um, uh, um, 
uh, service, you know, and sort of curate things there. And I have little service objects that talk to my nodes in Drupal um, and sort of make sure that, you know, if they, if they add a video to a playlist there, that I need to, you know, update the content on the node and back and forth. And so my little, um, you know, my little controller object, uh, you know, even though it you know, sort of lives and runs inside of Drupal, uh, you know, most of the time, or, you know, if I'm access accessing it through Drush, right, you know, it needs to talk to Drupal and tell things. Um, it itself is independent of either Drupal as just sort of one data store and this video provider as another data store. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can write it in a way that I'm writing all these little tests that just kind of say, like, hey, at this point, if you asked the Drupal library, do you have a node for video X, you know, it'll say yes. Um, at this point, it'll say no and make sure that you know, my little component is just sort of handling both of those cases. The exact same way that I'm mocking the service calls to this external API that's you know, sort of someplace else on the web. Um, does that help? I think so. I can think that there's another use case that you have. Okay. Other, other questions, thoughts? Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say with the um, need to completely decouple your code from the Drupal backend for testing. Is it practical to attempt to add this kind of testing to an existing project, or do you really have to get it from the, the beginning of a new one? Um, if you, you can certainly add it in just if in the existing project, you know, the next time you need to write a hook, do mm -hmm. this instead of what you did before, um, and sort of take it, take it forward. Uh, if you if you really want to um, go back and sort of uh, introduce you know PHP spec test coverage for code that you've already written, you're going to be doing a lot of refactoring. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. So that's so that's something to consider. I think it's it's worthwhile refactoring. I think you know as as a general um, uh, um, you know kind of extreme programming, agile programming kind of uh, philosophy. You know, refactoring is, is actually good. It's good for code, it's, it's good for maintenance. You know, assuming that you're doing it in a, in a context where you also have tests in place and you're refactoring to introduce tests. You know. But, you know, obviously time is a, is a, is a Yeah, it's, it's like I don't disagree, but <laughs> with fixed <laughs> contracts and budgets, it's sure. sometimes difficult. Um, kind of along the, the same lines, if I'm working with a team that doesn't have like experience with testing and, you know, doing mocking for dependencies, is it a pretty steep learning curve the first project you do it on, or is it something where it kind of slows people down for the first couple of weeks, but they get up to speed with it pretty quickly? It, it depends on how comfortable you are with sort of object-oriented design mm -hmm. patterns, and that and that is more or less the kind of programmer learning curve in moving from Drupal seven to Drupal eight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of what I like about this, uh, and you know, and just the general practice that I've adopted of using PHP components via Composer in my Drupal 7 projects um, is that it has really helped me to wrap my head around a lot of paradigms that libraries like Symfony use in, inside of Drupal 8. Um, and so I kind of feel like, you know, when we finally are ready you know, from a business perspective to like, okay, we're going to build something in Drupal 8, um, you know, I and the rest of our team who've been sort of working in this, in this way, I think the, sort of the, the conceptual leap from seven to eight um, won't be nearly as much of a challenge for us, mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's kind of why I'm encouraging folks who are still working in seven, you know, from there are a lot, um, to to think about adopting this, um, you know, this this kind of, this kind of style of programming, because um, it really will sort of help you to um, just understand, you know, it, Drupal in its relationship to PHP, you know, I mean, if people say it's 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 a little bit of an island. Um, and the sort of the more kind of general PHP modern practices are much more along these lines. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I, I I definitely recommend anyone who just sort of you know sees just PHP object oriented development as a core competency of them professionally to, to give this a try if they're still if they're still unsettled. Yeah. Yeah. So following on from that, if you have logic that's embedded in Drupal, say like set up this is logic in the rules, mm -hmm. um, then what testing tool would you turn to for that? Um, I, well, so rules is is an API, um, you know, and so you can certainly just kind of tell your little Drupal service object, um, you know, I mean basically sort of anywhere in a hook where you might have, um, you know, use the API to load a rule 
as an object and evaluate it and see what it says, you know, or sort of manipulate it. Um, you know, you just sort of wrap that in your little service wrapper, um, and then when you're writing your, your mock tests, you just kind of say like, hey, if I go looking at rules and I find, you know, um, that, you know, let, let's just set, you know, you're, you're telling your little Drupal mock object, you know, let, let's just say for the sake of argument, you look to see if there was a rule, and you said that there's a rule that says this, right? Now I write my code that sort of responds to that situation. Oh, well maybe, you know, we didn't find the rule, right? You know, I write my code that sort of responds to that situation. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, some things are a heavier lift than others um, in terms of mocking them just because, you know, Drupal passes around an awful lot of fairly complicated data structures, um, you know, and so you may need to, to get a little, uh, um, you know, nifty using the devel module or other things that can really sort of help you inspect these objects. Um, but, you know, it's a, a, a rule like anything that you would sort of get from Drupal or pass back to Drupal, you know, it has a identifiable structure that can be mocked. Yeah. So, uh, talk, you had a list of reasons why not to be had it, not to use be had it wasn't just that the plain English is sort of limited and, and, and you sort of get the wrong type of testing. Um, but other rules, uh, other reasons aside, like, oh, we have to load the entire Drupal bootstrap and blah, blah, blah. Um, that aside, why couldn't you just use feature context.php in B hat and skip learning like a whole other framework? Is it really that much of a, of a um, advantage over just sort of adding some extra functionality to B hat? So adding. So if you if you dive a little bit deeper into B hat, you can actually create your own like custom tests in B hat. Like um, assuming I log in as an administrator, which is not like. That's not an example because it is built in. But assuming I log in as Joe, and you taught the, and you can write a custom function inside Behat inside of FutureContext.php, which is just sort of like this extra little PHP library that you can create that lives inside of Behat, and you're putting all the same, very similar kind of language in there. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could do that, is it really worth the extra like performance improvement to just get rid of Behat entirely and and like learn a new framework? instead of just sort of like adding the same kind of PHP coding functionality inside of Behat itself. I guess, I guess I'm not entirely understanding sort of what, what would be happening inside of Behat. Are you talking about sort of writing Gherkin tests through Behat? No, no, I'm not talking about Gherkin. I'm talking about like writing yeah. this kind of, okay, forgetting what's actually possible, just imagining that you could write this kind of test within the Behat framework. So you're still running Behat, you're still having to bootstrap all of Drupal, which yeah. you know, I, I know the arguments against doing that, mm -hmm. but imagining that you could have like this kind of sophistication, you're actually writing object-oriented code inside, sort of like as a plugin to Behat, mm -hmm. um, would it still make sense to sort of learn this whole other framework rather than just using Behat? Uh, maybe not. Um, I mean, you know, B hat. Um, there are a lot of different ways I think that these tools can be sort of configured and sort of put together. Um, and you know, and, and this and this also, this is the whole just kind of like you know, giving a talk to share my experience. But you know, certainly, I'm not sort of a you know someone who's been doing testing for years and years and years. So I, you know, I'm sure that there are all kinds of kind of uh, arrangements that I haven't even thought about. I, I know that you know. Folks do use Behat to run kind of PHP unit stuff directly, um, and so um, you know I could I could for example imagine a kind of a, a Behat driver um, that was able to do some of this stuff through its own little uh, sort of step definitions, um, you know, and sort of talk to something like PHP spec that you know, unlike the Drupal driver or the JavaScript driver or whatnot, just doesn't load the site. Um, so um, yeah, I, I think I think that is certainly a possible direction. Um, so, sure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. We're a bit over time. Um, but any last questions or anything? How do you run your test? Do you run it off a commit or do you run it at some other trigger? Uh, so for this, I just I was just running it at the command line. You know, when you when you add PHP spec in uh, via Composer, um, it'll download binary um, you know, into your vendor directory that you can run. Um, and you can, you know, you can sort of do that module by module, or you can do it for your entire Drupal project um, you know, with a little bit of uh, 
uh, auto load um, you know, specification about what applying things. Um, and then, you know, I, most, most of our, our approach to trying to automate things is that, you know, we just have been trying to kind of get the test infrastructures running in such a way that we can run them locally. Um, and our sort of next frontier as the team is to be like, all right, let's get a robot that can do this. Okay. So, um, so, you know, you could certainly have Travis or Jamie yeah, or whatever. Cool. Yeah, you know, okay. when, once you, you know, once you sort of have this stuff kind of worked out and sort of working to your satisfaction, then the next thing is to sort of have some kind of, you know, you know, hook in your Git code that, that passes this to um, you know, some sort of automation server that then runs the behat tests and, you know, sort of passes the uh, pass or fail status back to you. So, um. All right. Thanks so much, everyone.